Welcome back to my channel. Da 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 da. It is day two for this Advent 2023 series. And today we're going to go back to the Old Testament and talk about the foreshadowing of the birth of Jesus. So, stick around. Uh, we will be using the Mysteries of the Messiah by Rabbi Jason Sobel and our trusty Bibles. Again, I use the uh, complete Jewish Bible version, the CJB. Um, I also like the ESV. Starting in looking at Genesis 46, 27, it says that the sons of Joseph born to him in Egypt were two in number. Thus, all the people in Jacob's family who entered Egypt numbered 70. Now, the cool thing about that is we have to remember how many people. This is why numbers, the book of numbers, is important. Um, just in case you ever thought that it wasn't important and that it was boring. I can assure you, to some extent, yes, but it is not. It is important. It's in there for a reason. One is that scripture tells us there were 70 people who came to Egypt, 70 Israelites who came to Egypt to live there. By the time they left, there was over 600,000. So, with the promise from Abraham, of Abraham, the, co the Abrahamic covenant, God told Abraham that he would multiply his offspring to a number that's too many to count. Um, couldn't count the stars, you can't count your kids. Or your kids' kids, or your kids' kids, kids' kids, kids' kids' kids. Like, there's going to be a lot of you. Um, now, because they started with 70 and then generations passed and the number of the Israelites grew, the Egyptians, the Pharaoh at the time, um, scripture tells us, began to worry about the Israelites becoming too powerful like too many Israelites so that if Egypt had an enemy, the Israelites might take the enemy's side and overtake us. There's so many of them. Um, and so his answer to the problem was to enslave the children of Israel, to enslave the Israelites. It was out of fear. So in Exodus chapter 1, verse 10, we see, come, let's use wisdom in dealing with them. This is the Pharaoh speaking. Otherwise, they'll continue to multiply, and in the event of war, they might ally themselves with our enemies, fight against us, and leave the land altogether. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built for Pharaoh the storage cities of Pidim and Ramses. But the more the Egyptians oppressed him, the more they multiplied and expanded until the Egyptians came to dread the people of Israel and worked them relentlessly, making their lives bitter with hard labor, digging clay, making bricks, all kinds of field work. And in, the, in, and in all this toil, they were shown no mercy. So, even though Pharaoh's idea was to enslave the Israelites in order that they would be worked to a point of not being able to have children, 
God said, no, I will use your persecution to cause you to prosper. Because you're being enslaved, I will make you multiply. It is by God's hand, love, that God's grace is evident in this, these few short verses that God's hand is on the Israelites. Yes, they may have had to suffer, or they did have to suffer. And for no reason other than the enemy feared them. Which is very timely. Uh, even though it's at a standstill right now. At least at the point of recording this. Um, but God will be, or God decided to bless the Israelites, even though they were suffering, even though they were being beaten down at the ha hand of somebody else, right? Uh, in, on page 72 of Rabbi Sobel's book he says this paradox of persecution and the resulting blessing demonstrates the power goodness and kindness of god the more physically weak the people became the more god's blessing was released so then we can move on like we can now move to moses that because the people were just kept multiplying. They just, the Israelites continued to be more and more and more. Pharaoh decided, fine, I will kill all of the, the sons. Yeah, just the sons. I will kill all of Hebrew sons and they will be thrown into the Nile River. Now, this is on page 73. So according to Jewish tradition, the astrologers of Egypt saw in a vision that the savior of Israel would soon be born and that his downfall would come by means of water. They thought their vision indicated that Moses would be killed in the water. So when Jacobed cast Moses into the water, although he was protected in, in an ark, the astrologers said they no longer saw the stars and signs they had seen as the downfall of the leader of the Hebrews by water. Therefore, they canceled their degree. So as soon as Moses enters into the water, as soon as the little baby Moses is gracefully put into the water. The scholars, the astrologers, stop seeing the vision. And they are under the assumption that it worked. That who they thought would save the, the Israelites was dead. Now, the irony of this is who saves Moses? Pharaoh's daughter. And not only does she save him, she calls him her son. He becomes a prince of Egypt. So what was meant to bring the demise of Israel led to his deliverance because he was put into the Nile River, the place that he, the other babies were thrown into to be slaughtered because he was put into this river. The river led him. God used the river to lead him to the hands of Pharaoh's daughter. She called him Moses and made him her, her son.
So we can remember that nothing can hinder God's plan. If God destined it to be, it will be. Now, we can see a parallel between Moses and Yeshua. So if we go to Matthew, go and flip over to Matthew chapter 2. Um, starting in verse 1. After Yeshua was born in Bethlehem, in the land of Ye Judah, during the time when Herod was king, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard of this, he became very agitated, and so did everyone else in Jerusalem. He called together all the head teachers and Torah teachers for the priests and the Torah teachers and the people and asked them, where will the Messiah be born? In Bethlehem of Judah, they replied, because the prophet wrote. This is the prophet uh, Micah. It says, in you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For from you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Herod summoned the Magi to meet with him privately and asked them exactly when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem with these instructions. Search carefully for the child and when you find him, let me know so that I too may go and worship him. And then we skip down. Um, to verse 16. Meanwhile, when Herod realized that the Magi had tricked him, he was furious and gave orders to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or less calculating from the time the Magi had told him. In that way were fulfilled the words spoken through the prophet Isaiah. No. Jeremiah. In that way were fulfilled the words spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, sobbing and lamenting loudly. It was Rachel, sobbing for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no longer alive. So we see that there's the... Um, Eastern idea or let's see eastern thought leaders so we have the magi and the astrologers who come to the ruling king and who's ruling over the israelites and says hey there is this king of the jews or there is this savior of the israelites that is going to be born or that has been born Where is he? Um, and the response of the leader is kill the kids. Kill all of the sons. Um, so that I don't have to worry about this. Um... Uh, 
As Jason Sobel says on page 74, both leaders decreed the murder of Jewish boys, which was satanically motivated to kill the promised seed of the woman. And that is the seed that God, in the curse of the woman, he declares that her seed, um, I think it's will, no, it's the curse of the, the serpent, that the seed of the woman will crush his head. So to, this is satanically motivated to prevent God's plan of redemption from being fulfilled. In these two acts, we get a glimpse of how the seed of the serpent continually tried to attack and bruise the seed of Eve, but to no avail. Now, if you remember from yesterday, we started to talk about how Jesus is the light of the world. Now, in both instances of Moses and Jesus, we see the divine light coming into play with their births. In Jewish tradition, when Moses was born, the whole house filled with divine light. And it's the belief that it's the same light that shown, that was shown, shined um, on the first day of creation. Um, as and it's believed that the light that came from Moses was a sign to his family and to the Israelites that the end of their exile was coming to an was coming now there is Also, the light that we see from the star, which wouldn't have been a star like we see when you go outside, um, when Jesus was born. That is the light that the Magi see that prompt them to go and find this king of the Jews. Now, the light that showed from Moses, as Rabbi Jason says, at his birth, was a sign that through him the light of salvation and redemption would would spring forth. Now he his birth was a sneak peek, a sneak preview of the birth of the Messiah, who would be greater than Moses. Therefore, his birth is more significant and associated with the divine light of God's glory. Now, these are when we think about what kind of star I just said, it's not a star that we see when we go outside at night. It is, it would have been the Shekinah glory, the, the light of God coming into the earth, coming through the birth of Yeshua. Um, now, this is why uh, scholar Arnold Frukenbaum gives for why it's not a literal star. 
It is Call the Messiah Star. It appeared and disappeared on at least two or more occasions. It moved from east to west. It moved from north to south. It literally came down and hovered over one particular house in the town of Bethlehem. Now the Hebrew word for star is kokav, which can mean radiance or glory. And the wise men found him not by a star, but through the Shekinah glory, which is God's manifest presence. So this is the same light that we see at creation. This is the same, which is the same light that we see at Moses' birth, which is the same light that we see here in Yeshua's birth. God came to be in dwelling with his people. And we see it time and time again that God's glory, his light, will be for all people. His light comes into the earth where whenever we get to the new heaven and the new earth, Yeshua will be our son. He will be the light of the earth. As John sees in uh, his vision for Revelation, uh, that is where we're going to end today. Uh, if you liked this series or this video, give it a like. Subscribe so that you can continue on in this series. And comment down below any of your thoughts. Again, as I say, I am a mom of three young kids, so I am not on all the time. But when I do get on, I will get back to you. So let's have a discussion down there. And... May God bless you, may he keep you, and give you his shalom. See you tomorrow.